Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Guys, part two. I just finished part one. My name's Connor. All the things I'd recommend watching part one, either my reaction to it or straight from the channel. That's up to you. Let's go. I learned a lot already from that, that first part, and I'm excited. My name is Indy Nidell, and this channel, The Great War, follows World War I week by week, exactly 100 years later. But before we can do that properly, we thought we'd give you a little background on Europe in 1914. Okay, the immediate cause of World War I was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which we'll cover in a separate special episode. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cultural hatred and nationalistic fever that led up to his assassination. This was something that was happening all over Europe. Heck, it was happening all over the world, but especially in the Balkans. So let's take a look at the empire of Austria-Hungary and the Balkan nations. Right. Now this empire, even as it still grew, was slowly being torn apart by the tensions of its multi-ethnic states, in particular, Hungary. the Slavic ones. Now oh. in 1908, Emperor oh, duh, I'm, I'm thinking of hungry Never mind, sorry. In particular, the Slavic ones. Now, in 1908, Emperor Franz Joseph had formally annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, this annexation inflamed anti Austrian hatred throughout the Balkans, but especially in Serbia, who were denied the chance of an Adriatic port by Austrian expansion into 375 miles of predominantly Slavic territory. This also gave Austria a base that she could use for any military adventures against Serbia. Now, what you have to realize is that the Slavs were split up between Austria, Serbia, Montenegro, and Bulgaria, and most of them dreamed of a pan-Slavic nation. These nations, though, except for Austria, had been not only part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries, but often violently oppressed parts of the Ottoman Empire, and only recently were they finally able to determine their own fates. So seeing Austria suddenly gobble up new territory with a sizable Slavic population, well, not good. If you look at Serbia in the first decade of the 20th century, here's what you find. So they were part of the Ottoman Empire, you know, suppressed and finally out of it. And now they see the Austrians trying to encroach over there. So they're kind of fed up with uh, other bigger nations, you know, encroaching into them. First and foremost, a young and proud nation. Serbia had only gained its independence from the Ottoman Empire in 1878, and it was intensely nationalistic. The rest of Europe looked at Serbia suspiciously, though, and its catchphrase, where dwells a Serb, there is Serbia. Well, you can see how that didn't sit well with a lot of people, and let's face it, the only way for Serbia to have united the southern Slav peoples would have been to bring down Austria-Hungary for good, which would have taken a war, which is kind of what happened. Fewer than five million people lived in Serbia, though, so all intentions aside, that wasn't going to happen by itself. However, in the search for allies, Serbia alienated a lot of Europe by the brutal and often violent repression of its own minority peoples, especially Muslims. In much the same way, Serbs and other minorities were repressed by Austria-Hungary. So they didn't get a whole lot of sympathy. And also, endless Balkan violence was nothing new to people. In fact, it was just one of those things that most Europeans were resigned to reading about in the papers from time to time. Another murder, another bombing, in that far-off corner of Europe where such things just seemed to happen, and regime change was often by murder. Actually, stereotypes aside, the last did happen in 1903. King Alexander and Queen Draga were murdered in their private apartments by a group of young army officers, and their bodies were mutilated. Now, one of the men responsible, Dragutin Dmitrievich, became a national hero when he was wounded by royal guards. He was also known simply as Alpis and had been a founding member and leader of the Black Hand, who organized the hit on the king and queen. The Black Hand. You just sort of know from the name that these guys aren't going to be devoted to, you know, starting soup kitchens or maintaining city parks. Anyhow, by the beginning of the First World War, there were thousands of members of the Black Hand, many of them Serbian army officers and even government officials. And this secret organization did pretty much what you would expect of a terrorist organization. Plan political murders train and equip guerrillas, and so forth. And they, and Serbian nationalist goals in general, got a big boost in 1912 and 1913 from the two Balkan Wars, which I'm going to tell you about right now. Okay, not right now, because to talk about the Balkan Wars, I first have to talk about the Moroccan crises. Now, there were two of these, one in 1905 and one in 1911, and you can look them up for details. But what they very basically and very generally involved 
was the Kaiser trying to drive a wedge between England and France, and hopefully even form an alliance between Germany and England. But they succeeded in doing the opposite and made the alliance between France and Britain stronger than ever and drove a deeper wedge between them and Germany. Another result was that France took control of Morocco. Now, at the time, Britain had Egypt, right? So what happens next is very important. Italy saw Ottoman land being seemingly handed out and thought, I gotta get me some of that. So Italy went to war. Now, because of all the Moroccan foolishness, Italy figured, correctly, that England, France, and Germany would do nothing to stop her. So she attacked the Ottoman Empire. The war lasted less than a month, and Italy successfully took Libya. And the dominoes start to fall. The Balkan states, seeing how easily the weakest of the powers could beat the Ottoman Empire, got together and attacked in the First Balkan War. Serbia, Montenegro, Greece, and Bulgaria, with Russian influence, formed the Balkan League, and together succeeded in driving the Ottomans out of the Balkans entirely for the first time in 500 years. It was a big loss for the Ottomans. However, one month after the war, Bulgaria, unsatisfied with the way the conquered territories were split up, turned around and attacked Serbia and Greece. The side note here, Serbia occupied Albania. Mm -hmm. It was a big loss for the Ottomans. However, one month after the war, Bulgaria, unsatisfied with the way the conquered territories were split up, turned around and attacked Serbia and Greece. The side note here, Serbia occupied Albania in the Second Balkan War and finally had a seaport of her own. But Austria issued an ultimatum to remove all Serbian forces from Albania within eight days. Serbia complied. Now, now as you may guess, this was all a complete mess. And here are some important results. Serbia pretty much doubled her territory in the Balkan Wars, even without Albania. And if you asked a Serb in early 1914, they'd probably say that wars seem to work out pretty well for them, but they pay a terrible price in the end. Between 1912 and 1918, one out of every six Serbs, men, women, and children, would die violently. After the collapse of the Balkan Wars, men, between 1912 and 1918, one out of every six Serbs, men, women, and children, would die violently. Jeez. After the collapse of the Balkan League and Russia's clearly pro-Serbian position in the Second War, Russia was left with only Serbia as an ally in the entire area. And Russia really wouldn't have much choice but to unconditionally support Serbia in 1914. Both Austria-Hungary and Germany were worried by Serbia's growth in both size and stature. And since a lot of German-speaking people saw Serbia as a Russian satellite, well, Austria was ready and willing to put its foot down on Serbian growth and Slavic nationalism. At the same time, after losing a war to Japan in 1905 and being unable to prevent the Bosnian annexation in 1908, the Tsar in Russia was willing and ready to put his foot down to prevent any further loss of face for Russia. And that's where we were in June 19. He looks almost identical to George in uh, in 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 the UK. To prevent any further loss of face for Russia. I know they're like cousins or something. And that's where we were in June 1914. All of these sides playing off. Sorry, wanted, I gotta shut up. I'm ready sorry. To put his foot down to prevent any further loss of face for Russia. And that's where we were in June 1914. All of these sides playing off one against the other, and at the epicenter of it all in the Balkans an organization that used terrorism and political murder to try and achieve its goals. And then Franz Ferdinand went to Sarajevo. If you missed our Prelude to War special number one, you can click here and watch it right now. You can also check out our other social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter. I'm ready for part two. Honestly, let's just get right into it. Let's go. First, as any schoolboy or schoolgirl knows, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. As any schoolboy or schoolgirl knows, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, June 28, 1914, was the match that touched off the conflagration of World War I. My name is Indy Nidell, and this channel, The Great War, follows World War I week by week, exactly 100 years later. First, about to go down. I'd like to talk a little about Franz Ferdinand himself, so here's a very brief bio. He was born in 1863, one of Austria's 70 archdukes. It wasn't called Austria-Hungary yet. 
Now, he became very wealthy just before he reached his teens when his cousin died and he was chosen to inherit a vast estate. Another death in 1889 changed his destiny enormously, the suicide of his cousin, Crown Prince Rudolf. This left Ferdinand's father heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, but he immediately renounced his position, leaving Franz Ferdinand next in line to rule the empire. He was still in this position when he died, by which time Emperor Franz Joseph was 84 years old and Ferdinand was 50. Now, if you read pretty much any bio, long or short, on Franz Ferdinand, you'll discover that not a whole lot of people actually liked him. Well, except his wife, the Duchess Sophia. She was a bohemian aristocrat, but without actual royal blood, so the imperial house made certain that neither Sophia nor any of her children could ever inherit the throne. This also meant they weren't much accepted by the Austrian aristocracy, in spite of his position as the next emperor, and a lot of people went out of their way to treat the Archduke and Duchess like crap. One other thing that every bio is sure to mention is Ferdinand's passion for hunting. He apparently recorded over 250,000 creatures killed in his 50 years on Earth. Now, I suppose that's 50,000 creatures killed Jesus. in his 50 years on Earth. Now, I suppose that's really neither here nor there, but what is here and there are Franz Ferdinand's beliefs. He was very conservative and let's just call it unenlightened to be polite. He hated the Hungarians. He thought the Slavs were less than human, and he actually referred to Serbs as pigs. He was also very strongly Catholic, which carried with it the anti-Jewish, anti-Jesuit baggage of the times. He did love his wife, though, with a great passion, and the preservation of the Austrian Empire. And that is something we'll come back to. Who are Jesuits? Uh, again, obviously it sounds familiar, but... ...passion, and the preservation of the Austrian Empire. And that is something we'll come back to in a few minutes. Before that, let's meet his assassin, Gavrilo Princip. Princip was a member of the Young Bosnians, one of several violent secret societies in the Balkans, and one who decided to kill Franz Ferdinand when he announced his June visit to Bosnia in March 1914. Okay, so in May, Princip and two associates went to Belgrade, Serbia, where they were provided with four pistols and six bombs by the Black Hand, and Princip had some shooting practice in a city park. Now that's not especially relevant. I just thought I'd like to point out that people had shooting practice in city parks back then. So at the end of May, Princip and company took an eight day journey to Sarajevo, planning to kill the Archduke. It's important to note here. Oh, right. I, I, I watched an extra credits, uh, I believe an extra credits about this, and, and it was sort of a, a lucky circumstance that, that led him to being in the right place at the right time, right? That the Austrian authorities and the Archduke himself were aware of the danger of some sort of murder attempt, since these sort of things were pretty commonplace in the empire, and especially in the Balkans. Now here's a quote from Franz Ferdinand, the day he began his journey to Sarajevo and his car overheated. Our journey starts with an extremely promising omen. Here our car burns, and down there they will throw bombs at us. So, the evening before they were supposed to arrive in Sarajevo, right? Franz Ferdinand and Sofia surprised everyone by turning up early, just on impulse. And they had a really nice time wandering around the town, which was a pretty exotic place back then. And later that evening came one of the great foreshadowing moments of all time. A member of the Bosnian parliament who had urged Ferdinand and Sofia to cancel the whole trip for reasons of safety was presented to Sofia. And she said this, Things do not always turn out the way you say they will. Wherever we have been, everyone, down to the last Serb, has greeted us with such great friendliness, politeness, and true warmth that we are very happy with our visit. Okay, so far so good. But then the guy, whose name was Sunarik, answered this. Your Highness, I pray to God that when I have the honor of meeting you again tomorrow night, you can repeat those words. Then they had a big banquet that night, and late the next morning, coincidentally their 14th wedding anniversary, the Archducal motorcade left Sarajevo station. No fewer than seven young Bosnian hitmen were deployed on the town's bridges, one of which the Archduke had to cross. Now, one of the young Bosnians threw a bomb at the Archduke's car, but it bounced off his hood before it exploded, wounding two of the Archduke's men. The motorcade drove on to the town hall, and they listened to a bunch of the usual speeches. And then, after that, Franz Ferdinand before it exploded, wounding two of the Archduke's men. And they just carry on? ...of which Duke's car, but it bounced off his hood before it exploded, wounding two of the Archduke's men. 
The motorcade drove on to the town hall. They listened to a bunch of the usual speeches. And then, after that, Franz Ferdinand changed his plans. He decided to visit the men who'd been hurt by the bomb to see if they were okay. So he wanted to go toward the hospital. But there was a lot of confusion over the new route and who'd been told what and who hadn't been told what. So when the Archduke's driver turned off the Apple key, the general sharing Ferdinand's car told the driver, no, no, back up and continue on Apple key. So the driver stopped the car because it had no functioning reverse gear. And he stopped it right next to where Gavrilo Princip was standing. So Princip raised his pistol and fired twice from a distance of only a few feet away. Sophie died instantly, and Franz Ferdinand's last words were, Sophie, Sophie, don't die. Stay alive for our children. Franz Ferdinand died shortly after. Now, it's pretty amazing when you think about it that this whole enterprise could have possibly succeeded. I mean, it was so incredibly amateurish. And had the Austrian authorities taken any precautions whatsoever... A bomb exploded a bit earlier killing some of his, like, guards or, or men around him, and he just still continues on. Well, I mean, think about it. There are loads of people who think the Black Hand had more to do with it, but you'd think they'd plan a little better, or heck, plan at all. Anyhow, here were the immediate results. Word of the assassination spread instantly throughout Europe, and in Bosnia, by the end of July, more than 5,000 Serbs had been jailed, many of whom were later hanged when the war broke out. Princip was put in prison, being 27 days too young to receive the death penalty under Austrian law. Now, there were one or two European leaders who were seriously worried about the political consequences of the act, but most of Europe reacted by thinking it was more of the same. The usual Balkan business, another Balkan killing. There was very little mourning, even in Vienna, for the unloved Franz Ferdinand, and his funeral service only lasted 15 minutes. But there was one thing that became apparent only years later. You see, Princip, or the Serbs, or the Black Hand, or whoever you like to say was behind the killing, really, really, really got the wrong guy. Franz Ferdinand, for all his talk about Serbs being pigs, or Russian autocracy being a good model for the future, for all his backward and outdated beliefs, had strong opinions on two very important things. One, in contrast to most of the empire, he was absolutely against any war with Russia and stated repeatedly that he would do anything in his power to prevent it. And two, since he put the empire above his personal beliefs and to make the empire work once again, he was sympathetic to the idea of making the bipartite state of Austria-Hungary into a tripartite state of Austria, Hungary, and a union of the Slavic peoples as the third part of the empire. So when a Serb killed Franz Ferdinand, it was a killing that was not only against Serbian interests, but since the Austrian Empire used the killing as a justification to invade Serbia, even if it meant war with Russia, Princip killed the one and only person in the Empire who was determined and able to prevent that war, Franz Ferdinand. This was episode number three of our Great War Prelude to War specials. Now, if you missed the first two episodes, you can click this one. I'd recommend watching the first ones, and we'll get into the uh, week one, actually, watch prior to this by accident to these three preludes. But I'll, I'll, I'll upload that after I upload these. But, so he, he... Whoever you like to say minutes was going to... Um, Many day want all for them really, really serves be backward and against one sec. Anyone. So he, he wanted to create a third, like an an, an Austrian kind of like it was Austria Hungary and then a Serbian uh, part. Does that mean like where Bosnia is? He he was going to make that like a. I, I'm just struggling how to how, to see how that plan by Franz Ferdinand to make a Slavic section of, of the empire was in Serbia's interests. Because wouldn't Serbia not want Slavs or Slavic lands to be part of that empire? I'm not exactly sure. Great show, though. Love Indy. The Great War, great channel. All his channels. Time Goes History, World War II. Sabaton History is great, where they have Indy on. Awesome. Um, I'm going to upload these and then upload the uh, part one, which I already did. And, uh, yeah, day one. Yeah, awesome. I'm excited. See you guys next time.